discussion on connected case management. My name is Desmond Brady and I'm Head of Public Sector Strategy at Thomson Reuters Legal UK and Ireland. From the moment an individual comes under suspicion of having committed an offence, every action taken by every actor in the criminal process is converging on that single inevitable point of decision in the courts. So if we're talking today about efficiency in the criminal uh, justice system, surely the, the courts are at the heart of that. Court staff, judges and their partners in the agencies across the justice system are making increasingly significant bets on new technologies to help them manage cases more effectively and efficiently. And when you're assessing the benefits and impacts of those new technologies, surely there's no more worthwhile um, or rewarding um, pastime than considering the, the experiences of colleagues in comparable jurisdictions who've also begun to, to start down that journey of, of modernization. So with that in mind, I'm delighted to welcome to the conference uh, Chief Judge Pete Cahill. Judge Cahill is the Chief Judge of the Hennepin County District Court in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where he presides over the criminal justice uh, system and the, manages the trial court system for 1.2 million county residents. Judge? I think it's 1.4 million now. 1.4 million <laughs> county residents and 62 judges. Judge Cahill has been a judge since 2007 and currently serves as the chair of the Minnesota Judicial Branch E-Court Steering Committee. Before his appointment to the bench, he was Chief Deputy County Prosecutor in Minneapolis, where he served on several technology committees, including the Minnesota E-Charging Design Committee, also the Minnesota Criminal and Juvenile Information Task Force, the Juvenile Network Work Group, and the Hennepin County Justice Integration Program and Advisory Board. Judge Cahill practiced in criminal litigation, both as a defense attorney and a prosecutor, for 23 years before his appointment to the bench, during which he saw the practice of law evolve from electric typewriters to statewide case management systems and entirely paperless courts. So, Judge Cahill, thank you so much for making the journey to be with us here today. Oh, well, thank you, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Last time I was in London was in 1981, with my new wife, she's still my current wife. <laughs> You'll report back to her that I did not say my old wife. Uh, and so it's a real pleasure to be back here after so many years. We've got a great deal of experience to, to talk through here. Um, we've got a number of questions already submitted, which I'll start by putting to Judge Cahill. However, at intervals, we'll open the floor for questions from the audience as well. So if you have comments, observations, or questions, please hold on to them and we'll, we'll try and get to you. So, Judge Cahill, could you start by giving us a brief kind of survey of the impact of technology in the Minnesota Criminal Court during your career? Well, as Des said, we started with electronic typewriters or electric typewriters. Uh, my legal secretary, when I was first called to the bar, was a woman named Vi, whose nickname was the Viatola, because if you did any changes to a draft, she had to retype the whole thing and she was never happy about it. Uh, <laughs> since then, obviously, we have changed to uh, we started with standalone desktop computers that were not connected in any way, and so you had to constantly reinvent the wheel. Then we went to networks with client, which is uh, just the computer workstation connected to a server down in the basement. And now we are fully web-based. In Minnesota, we have a case management system that is web-based. It's housed in St. Paul, the capital of our state, and it serves the entire state. The, geographically, Minnesota is the same size as uh, England, Scotland, and Wales put together, to give you some uh, idea. Uh, we have about a tenth of the people, but we are about the same size geographically, which of course becomes important for infrastructure when you are in a statewide network and you have to have a good fiber optic network, for example. And so now we are completely web-based. Uh, I can access my case management system, and in fact did this morning, just to make sure I was not lying to you. Uh, I can access it from here, in fact I looked up a few cases that I have waiting for me when I get back. All electronic documents now, we have no paper. When I'm in court, I, I have a uh, touch screen computer on, on the bench, which I can fold up and down. Uh, that was very important to judges, uh, that they be able to keep eye contact and not be blocked and behind a screen. Uh, not a minor point, but everything I have now, I access on the computer, nothing paper. 
Um, one thing that was highlighted in the Leveson report is that so far as the UK criminal justice system is concerned, there, there is no such single system, rather there are a series of criminal justice participants, each of whom has their own obligations and priorities and operates within their own financial constraints. How does that compare with your experience in Minnesota and, and what has been your experience of bringing together agencies to deliver technological changes? And can I do a little survey? If you can just raise your hand, how many police related folks? Okay, how many legal aid? You're the only legal aid lawyer. It's always true. <laughs> oh, <laughs> always true that legal aid is alone. No, uh, prosecution <laughs> services? Okay, and what about it? Uh, corrections, Department of Corrections? Okay, anybody else that I've missed? Cool. Of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> See, I forget myself sometimes. <laughs> Courts, how many? Okay. Uh, the experience talked about in the Levison report is, I think, universal. We have the same issue. We are not that much a system. I think one of the uh, people in the audience said this morning, uh, more as a collection of people who are not coordinated. We have that same issue. We always have, and to some extent, still are. But what we've realized is a, the idea of a common platform is good. It just depends on, it depends on how you define that. Uh, if you're all using the say, same case management system or if you're all using different modules of the same case management system. Uh, to an extent, that's also a common platform. And I'll give you our experience on what we've gone to. We do not have a common platform to the extent that we have one case management system that everybody uses. We found that we actually had one of those uh, back in the 80s. Uh, we, there were problems with that. One thing was data ownership. Who owns this data? We're all contributing it to it. Whose fault is it that this got screwed up? That, and so data ownership was an issue. There are certain things, pieces of information that the police don't want the prosecutor or the courts to know and vice versa. Everybody wants to keep their data to some extent and be able to select what goes out to different agencies or to the public. And so I think you, we would describe ours not as a common platform now, but more of a federated <coughs> platform. Everyone has their case management systems. And we've all seen the role of the central government as to set up the standards, that it should meet certain technical specific standards, you know, that it be web-based, that it be, is it, I'm looking to Steve in the back, global XML schema compliant, stuff like that. It's got all the technical requirements so that we have interoperability because if you buy a proprietary system that can't talk to anything else, what good are you? Because you may be good for your own agency, but it has to be able to transmit messages. And then from that, I'm getting way too technical, so roll your eyes if I'm getting way too far in the weeds. Uh, we use an integration broker that sends messages. So this is all automated messages. When I change bail, I'm in court on the bench. I order a change in the bail status of the accused in front of me. Our clerk enters that in the courtroom in our case management system. No document, right into the system. The system sends a message to the jail saying, this person's bail is now set at X. It used to be Y. And so through that messaging, we are coordinated because we have worked out, and that's that justice integration program that was part of my uh, introduction. That's what that group does. We figure out what does each agency need to know, what do we have to build to send messages automatically. Not send emails. These are automated messages that as soon as I update my system, it pushes the data to another place. So we've had that same issue with different agencies who have different interests, and we've decided the best way is not to have one system, but to have each system compliant with certain standards, and then use automated messaging to push the data around and not have it having to be keyed by anybody. Mm -hmm. And that's been our solution. But whenever you're looking at this, our experience has been, you always have to figure out what works for everybody involved. Everybody has to get something out of a design. If it works for the court but not for legal aid, it's not going to be accepted. If it works for the courts but not for prosecution services, it's not going to be accepted. So you do have to get together and figure out what will be a benefit to these people. When we get to e-filing, I can talk a little more about that. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if we might start with a, a, a pause for questions. Are there any questions at this early stage? If so, could you raise a hand? Yes, okay. Uh, Does sorry. it work? <laughs> would, would, would you mind telling us your, um, telling us your name, role, and, and organization? Um, I'm Jerry Ray from the CPS 
yes, Special Crime Division. Um, and I want to know, does it work, please? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Next one. <word>, no. <laughs> it's constantly in a state of building because the first and easiest is when you're actually pushing pieces of data. For example, I gave the example of setting bail, and that automatically gets a, sent a message to the jail management system. The harder part, which involves e-filing and someday in the future document integration, is when we produce those documents, a pre-sentence investigation. And by the way, if I'm using terms that are foreign, let me know, because I know I talk fast, I use acronyms, and I have an accent. So feel free to have me repeat. But anyway, a pre-sentence investigation or a complaint, like an indictment, information, whatever your term is, those documents that have to be produced, we are just in the initial process of actually having those produced in a system, not just having a Word document converted to a PDF and then e-filed. Uh, so for the data, that's worked very well. We push the data around, it's automated. In fact, there, to give you an idea, there are a million of those messages being automatically sent every month uh, in Minnesota. So throughout the state, that's a million things that a clerk once upon a time had to key in uh, to their system. For example, the jail clerk looks at the bail, it got changed, the deputies came back and reported a change, they had to manually key that. That's a million data entry points that we save every month by having the data go in automatically and being sent around the various systems. The next step is the document integration. When somebody produces a substantive document, what we are currently uh, rolling out or piloting is, for example, a pre-sentence investigation. We have the benefit where our Department of Corrections around the state, although we have three different delivery systems for corrections, uh, and prisons and probation, they are all in one common case management system themselves. And by doing that, we are working on where they actually just produce the pre-sentence investigation like they would have in a Word document. Except now they'll be able to do it and there'll be a button at the bottom that says, send and then all the magic is already programmed. So all the logic behind it, when you hit send, it gets sent to all the parties that are on the case, it gets filed with the court, it gets filed with the court with an updating of what it is that a pre-sentence investigation was filed, and it gives it an appropriate level of access, public or confidential. And so for a pre-sentence investigation, because it includes chemical dependency data, mental health data, those automatically get coded as confidential. And by making it automatic and having the logic built in behind the scenes, you avoid the human error of a clerk looking at it and going, oh, this is a public document, and out it goes. Thank you. So I think it works pretty well. We're still working on it. <laughs> Were there any more questions? Um, yes, lady down at the front, please, Nikki. Just down here. Um, hello, Heather Monder, Hampshire Constabulary. Um, did you experience, or any of the other organizations within the criminal justice uh, system, experience any cultural issues in adapting to new ways of working within the technology? If so, I'd be really interested to hear about those. All the problems are cultural. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. This, I tell people all the time, uh, this is not an IT project. It really is not. The IT exists. The technology exists. Web-based systems exist. It's not the problem there. It's changing the culture. And can you imagine, you know, judges tend to be a little older than average than the average uh, lawyer who's appearing in front of me. And so you can imagine the culture of change is not readily accepted. Uh, but it's throughout all the agencies, we have a resistance to change. Everyone likes their paper. And if all you do is, I, I, this is a made up word, but I use it a lot. If you just electronify, the current process, you have not gained the efficiencies. <laughs> you have to look at what, in a bigger sense, brainstorming sense, wouldn't it be nice if the moment it came out of the judge's mouth, it automatically got updated and sent to all the people who had to know. Mm -hmm. Then you turn to the IT folks and say, how do we change our business process so that we can accommodate that? And that's the real challenge, is overcoming the, well, this is the way we've done it. And I'll give you an example from my own court. When we started e-filing, so lawyers started to e-file documents, we decided that we were going to be in one world. We're not going to have a file that's half paper and half electronic. Can you imagine trying to make sure you have both in one place and what judges would think about that? So we went entirely electronic. All our active open cases we scanned and we made entirely electronic. Any paper that came in from people who were not e-filing, self-represented litigants, 
and the lawyers before it became mandatory. For all those, we scanned, made it electronic. What was the culture? The culture was, I'm a clerk at the court, I get a document, I file it. So the manager bought a desktop scanner for each and every one of them. And I'm like, why are we doing this? Why can't somebody be the expert at <laughs> scanning it, sending it to the next step, or sending it on so that we have expertise and cross-training that not everyone is just electronifying the old way of doing things. And when I think you think more creatively like that, you also have then to get away from the problem of culture, you have to provide the tools for everybody. Yeah, yeah, and which means you have to involve everybody. Our biggest problem when we did e-filing is we focused more on the administrative, the back office, and how when we get an electronic document from a law firm, how do we get that into the system? We didn't think as much about how would the judges consume that electronic document. And the idea of a computer on their bench was new, the tools were not great, I heard a lot of complaining, I think there was a bounty on my head for a while. <laughs> and so finally we said, okay, we have to come up with the tools, and we did. Internally in-house, we actually developed a system we call Benchworks, which works off of our case management system, which is a view for judges where they can uh, quickly go between cases, look at documents easily, make notes on the case file or on documents. That we developed in-house. That was not with our vendor, which, by the way, is not Thomson Reuters. Um, but we developed all that to make it easier for judges. And I've told all our developers, here's what you need to know about judges. The more you can make that electronic process look like paper, the better it's gonna be. One of the speakers this morning talked about highlighting and using the red pen, and, and I do that too. And so I, if there's a way to take that electronic document out of the case management system and dump it into my iPad, and I can use one of the many apps out there for annotating, I'm a happy camper. And that's what I do now. I never take, uh, I never have to obviously worry about a case file coming home with me because it's always electronic. I access it from home and I download the documents and I read them and I highlight them for like my next day's hearing. If I, if I have a motion hearing and I have lawyers arguing points of law in front of me, I have the documents at home and I can highlight and annotate. So it's getting the right tools that make it familiar is the best way to get past culture change because the issues are culture, mm -hmm. huge. Thank you. I, I think there was there one more question in the third row. Yes. Um, thank you, Stuart. Hello, my name's uh, Tim Barraclough from the Scottish Court Service, so another colleague jurisdiction rather than the one that, that's here. My question is, is this. You're describing a case management system that makes the information more accessible and distributed more easily. To what extent does it actually help you actively manage the case? In other words, make sure that documents are submitted in time, that you hold people to account for you know, mm -hmm. doing stuff when they are meant to do it, because we have a major issue, certainly in Scotland, I don't know about in England and Wales, where cases are delayed because of the lack of preparedness of the parties. The way we do that uh, is we have certain entries that are standard for when we expect submissions from parties. If there is a motion due, if there is a scheduling order, if there is a whatever document that we expect from the parties, we actually put it in under the code uh, for submission with a due date. And then we have reports that come to every judge, and I know when my orders are due, we, are under, uh, we have a 90-day rule. All my orders have to be out in 90 days. So I get one for me on when are my orders due. Uh, as chief judge, I also get all the other judges' reports so I can see if somebody's about to slip. But we also get one on orders for submissions on cases for judges. So I know that the prosecution service has a brief due to me within, you know, by next Tuesday. And if it's not there, my clerk calls up and says, your document was due, where is it? Uh, because they know we have that, we've seen better compliance with deadlines and rules. In fact, uh, I don't recall the last time a lawyer uh, blew a deadline without calling and saying why they needed an extra, uh, an extension of time. So by putting an event in your case management system, you have to have the reports, and that's the other part of this. Case management systems are fine, but you also have to have either canned reports that your vendor can put in there, or if you have a research department. I actually have a research department. We're big enough for that, and I think it's important we have it. They can produce documents for me on the fly. And if I say, I want this document, uh, they can usually pull the data out. But you need those reports because that's how you manage your cases. 
aside from the steely glare over the uh, <laughs> reading glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for, the, for those questions. We will come back later for more audience questions, so if you have one, please do, please do hold on to it. Um, could you talk to us about, at the upstream end, Judge Cahill, the introduction of electronic evidence, e-disclosure of police reports, um, and the impact that that type of technology has had on your case management? Okay. Culturally, the courts, and I'm not sure here, culturally the courts have stayed out of the e-disclosure mm -hmm. in criminal cases between, unless there's a dispute. Mm -hmm. uh, we've stayed out of that, but because of our closer and closer integration, I've mm -hmm. become more involved in that. This is a huge challenge because, especially in the era of body-worn cameras and taped recording of statements, video of crime scenes, that it's a lot of material. And if you try and just send it around, you're going to pl pl uh, plug up any bandwidth you have. Uh, and so that's been a real challenge. Uh, for police reports on that, our two major players in Minneapolis, which is the Minneapolis city attorney. They prosecute low-level uh, offenses. Uh, and the public defender, which is our legal aid, they have a system where automatically when a police officer adds a new report to an existing case, it all automatically checks to see if there's a public defender on it, and it will automatically forward, if it's marked as evidentiary, it'll automatically be forwarded to that public defender so they know they find out about new reports in a case as early as the police do. So again, it's one of those uh, systems where the more you can automate that flow of information, of documents, and everything else, it would be great if we could have video and audio and photographs be a part of that stream. Uh, but right now, it's mostly reports. It's documents. I think the answer is going to be, and this is, again, don't just electronify the current system. I think we send discs around or we send, you know, we used to send videotapes. I can remember when we had cassette tapes for disclosure. So, yes, I'm that old. So, uh, but that's really not the way to do it as we get more and more. I think we have to think more in terms of where are the police going to put this information, all the body-worn camera stuff that uh, was being talked about this morning. Where is all that video going to be stored? Leave it there and then figure out how you grant access to people to it as opposed to trying to move it around. Because I think when you're trying to move it around, all you're doing is taking up bandwidth, you're taking up storage. Do you really need five different copies of that same video? It's better if, let's figure out a way of having it in one spot and determining access rights, be they temporary or permanent, and go from there. So I think that's on the e-disclosure, uh, what we're trying to do is figure out the ESI, the electronically stored information, that puzzle. The documents are fairly easy. Hmm. Thank you, Judge. We, we, you've, you've talked uh, already about a number of the lessons that you've learned along the way in incorporating some of these technologies. Are there any other kind of key lessons learned that you would highlight? Uh, number one is infrastructure. You cannot do all this unless you make sure you have good infrastructure. And by that, I'm, in fact, one of our first projects. Uh, Again, I mentioned our geographic size. The first thing we did was work with uh, the other branches of state government to build up our fiber optic network. Aside from the metropolitan area, uh, we have very many long, distant rural courts with, that did not have good internet connection. So we essentially had to put fiber down. And so you have to have good fiber connection or good system of some sort to be able to spread your data, good bandwidth. You need Wi-Fi. You need Wi-Fi in the courts. You need Wi-Fi in all the offices. The one thing we forgot about was Wi-Fi in the jails because our legal aid lawyers are going to the jail to review a case with their client. It's all electronic, but they have no Wi-Fi and all the documents are stored back on their server. And so we actually did a project for that. So remember, good infrastructure everywhere that everybody works, be it in chambers and uh, the courtroom, outside the courtroom, lawyers' offices, jails, they have good Wi-Fi. So between good Wi-Fi and the last one is the one I learned in which gave me part of my ulcer, yes, medically diagnosed E-cord-induced ulcer, <laughs> uh, was disaster recovery. When we started e-filing and we had a bunch of electronic documents and no paper, about six months into it, I asked someone very innocently, so do we have duplicate copies somewhere? The answer was no. 
Are we working on it? Yes. I, I think they, when they ever they hear me say that now, they know the answer is always going to be yes to the judge, <laughs> and then we'll work on it. But I think they legitimately were working on it because they were actually going to open uh, disaster recovery. I'm not allowed to call it disaster recovery anymore because it sounds too negative. So it's high availability. <laughs> so our high availability center was opened about six months, a little over six months after we started e-filing. Uh, because of course what happens when you accept electronic documents, you put them on a server, the server goes bad. If you don't have duplicate copies that are physically distant from each other, you're going to have a problem. And so now we do have, in fact we have three copies. We have the original which is stored in St. Paul electronically. We have one about 20 miles away in one of our suburbs. Uh, on a separate site that is real-time replication. And then we have a third one, which is our last-ditch disaster recovery. It's not real-time, but it's overnight. There's a batch that will constantly refresh. And so we have that third site just in case, uh, in an unlikely event that both our downtown St. Paul and our suburban location goes down. And those serve the entire state. So good infrastructure is number one. Number two is training. Part of the culture change requires that you train people, that you have people who are designated to train. With judges, we found out it worked best one-on-one, -on -one, to actually go to their chambers, work with their staff one-on-one -on -one as opposed to do a class. Because in a class of judges, judges are not shy about saying, hey, I didn't get that, slow down. You, your class will devolve to the slowest judge. So we found one-on-one -on -one with judges is better. Uh, but you have to have training for everybody who's involved in the system. Because uh, that infrastructure is not going to do you any good if you don't train people how to use the tools you have. And the third thing I'm going to talk about is access. We are so focused on getting electronic and getting the, the s documents pushed throughout the system that you always have to remember access. And again, I'm not familiar with what the culture is. Court records in the U.S. are presumptively public. And the public has a right to see most of the documents filed in court. The same is not true of police and prosecution. Uh, unless it's filed with the court, those tend to be more private. Some of it is public, but not quite as much. The investigative file is not entirely public, uh, so that's a little different. And again, that's why maybe you need federated systems as opposed to one common system. But you have to think about access, whether you have a common platform or not. And you have to come up with different security levels. What's, we have five, actually. Public one, public two. Public one is going to someday be available remotely, so you can even check over here on our cases and actually read the documents that were filed. Court orders, motions by parties, briefs, those are all going to be accessible over the web. We're still working on that technology. Public two is everything that is otherwise publicly available and is at the courthouse. So you come to our record center, which is now a bank of computers, and you can look anything up. But there are some documents that are, we're going to keep there, but never publish on the web. And then you get into the confidential documents, which are available only to the parties not to the public generally. I mentioned pre-sentence investigation. Uh, and then, then finally we have sealed. So we have two levels of confidential and sealed. That's what we came up when we looked at all the different types of documents, especially in the criminal justice system, and said this type of document is going to be public one, public two. The reason why you have to think about that so early, we didn't. That was a problem because when we were talking about putting it out publicly, we didn't have good security on our initial documents. We had to go back and do it because you have to think right away, what's the security level I'm going to attach to this document because someday this is going to be out on the web and I don't want a confidential document being published out. So you have to think, I think, early on, what about access and therefore how am I going to classify the different types of documents? Think about that really, really hard. It's a lot of work, but it's well done if you do it ahead of time before you start electronic documents whether they're scanned or e-filed. Because it's not the old days where some member of the public wants to come up to the counter, see a file. The clerk can do a last minute scan to make sure this is the only stuff you get to see. It's going to be on a computer now. There's no clerk intervention. That is an efficiency, but it also means you have to get it right on classification at the outset. So think real hard on access. And finally, start thinking now about statutes, laws, rules, and what has to be changed to facilitate the electronic environment. I can't tell you how many times the word paper was in our rules. And since we don't have paper anymore, we had to change it to documents. But that's just a small example. Uh, we had to change the rules to require that parties e-serve each other using our system uh, to get everyone in compliance. 
So I think between infrastructure training, mm -hmm. access, and uh, rules, that'll cover you pretty well. Do those early, do them often. Thank you. You seem to set a lot of store um, by the management information that you extract from the system. And you mentioned you have a dedicated research function. Could you tell us a little bit about that and the, the impact that's had on your management of, of cases through the system? We actually have um, three research people that work for the district court just in my district. There are 10 districts in Minnesota. Ours is the largest. We are probably about 30 to 40 percent of the court work in the state. And so we have three and their job is to come up with the reports that help us manage the ones I've mentioned. But occasionally we'll get a public data request. Uh, I just received one from, of all places, Pittsburgh, from a newspaper in Pittsburgh that wanted to know our racial data for low-level offenses because they're looking for policing and whether or not our court data shows a lot of dismissals of cases that end up in by race, is there a disparity? And so our research people, in order to satisfy the public data requests, uh, are able to generate that for us and it does not take administrative time. And they're also expert at what they do. They know the system inside and out. They know how to extract the data into their own research, SPSS, if any of you were uh, curious, uh, into their systems to be able to, to manipulate it and provide it to the uh, different parties. And if you look on our website, actually, under the mncourts.gov, uh, we have an e-file and e-serve page, or pages, that is quite extensive, which even includes some statistics on how quickly we process e-filed cases and where they come from, government, judiciary, or uh, private firms. Thank you. Um, that seems like a good time to open up again to any questions from, from the audience. Uh, there's one just here. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Neil Kahn from the Courts and Tribunal Service in England and Wales. Um, your high availability service, get it right, um, do you do any local caching? Because one of the things people are concerned about from our point of view is not just loss of the central server or loss of access to the central server and the data, but also loss of, of network. And when we're entirely paperless, one earth happens when we turn up in court and we can't get the papers and we send everyone home. So we've just been looking at whether we need to do any sort of local caching. Do you do, you do similar or is it not a problem? We actually have, because of our size, we have a local document store. Um, and that's, so there are different document stores around the state that are uh, the primary. Uh, ours is in St. Paul. Uh, we don't have one in the tower itself. Uh, we do, I think, have a daily cache that is purged every day. So we don't keep a, an ongoing one because we rely on St. Paul and their replication to the other two sites. Uh, it does bring up a disaster recovery question which is what happens when the network goes down. And someone is writing up a plan for me now, but basically I talked about that system that we designed internally that attaches to our case management systems. We call it Benchworks. It provides all the information you need in court. It has the documents and the calendar of minutes and his case history in it. And with that, if the network were to go down, that system is actually web-based out of our suburban office, uh, our suburban data center. And so, worst came to worst, I could open up my iPad, turn on the hotspot uh, with cell data, have the clerks connect to this, and we all get on the Benchworks, which is in, so even if the tower went out, the whole network, although people say, and what about if electricity goes out? I'm like, if electricity goes out, I'm not working in the dark, I'm going home. <laughs> Especially in the summer or the, when the air conditioning needs to be on. And so, even if the network were to go down, we still have access that we could do court for that day. Our uh, disaster recovery center is the one in a uh, suburban location is actually down to a 15 minute failover. So if we go down on the main servers, it's 15 minutes and we'll be up and running again statewide. Thank Which you. is not cheap, by the way. <laughs> Thank by you. the way, none of this is cheap, but it is so worth it. And any more questions from the audience? Oh, step. <coughs> Hi, Damon Norville from the Courts and Tribunal Service in England, Wales again. Um, you've talked uh, a lot about ac across the agencies, and forgive me, I just don't know enough about the American justice system to know if this is relevant, but have you thought about moving out or have you moved out at all into sort of self-service for members of the public engaging with the justice system? I don't know, either defendants for low-level cases being able to make pleas online 
or oh. witnesses, jurors, etc. Great fact. question, yeah. Uh, we have a number of self-service options uh, yeah. that members of the public, if you're a juror, for example, you can, you, if you get a summons to jury duty, you're expected to fill out a basic questionnaire of your background. That, you can all do it online now, uh, just like you're ordering a book from Amazon. And that'll be accepted and be ready for when you come to court. Uh, we also have a payment center since even though we have 1.8 million new cases in Minnesota every year, the vast majority of those are parking offenses, traffic offenses, minor, fine only. And because our governing body, the Judicial Council, uh, which I'm a part of as a chief judge, set fine payments for different offenses uh, as a standard, you can go on to our website and again, like ordering a book, it's just you're not going to get anything. Uh, all you're going to get is no warrant. Uh, yeah, you're going to get the bill. But you can enter your citation data and you can um, actually just pay it online so you don't have to come into court. We also have hearing officers who are starting to do uh, remote hearings, basically on Skype. These are not on the record uh, court appearances. They're just meeting with a hearing officer because the prosecution service has given them limited, uh, not a lot of discretion, but limited rules that they can, for example, two speeding tickets. If they come in and want to plead to one and you will dismiss the other, go ahead and do that. And so our hearing officers will do that in person by appointment. They will do it uh, remotely by Skype, any method that the person wants to call in on the phone. Uh, generally, we like the people there to have the identification correct, uh, but most people aren't working out other people's tickets and paying money, so it's not been a problem. Uh, so paying out the minor offenses online, those are our primary. We also have a self-help center. Again, this is all on our website if you ever want to check it. The Self-Help Center provides a lot of online documents for people who are self-represented litigants where they can just fill out the form. That's our current, that is not where I want to be and not where we are going to be in about two years. I expect by that time we will have fully rolled out what we're piloting now, which is, uh, I don't know if, I fill out my taxes using a TurboTax as our program, which is, it asks me questions, I answer them, and then it tells me how much to send the government. I haven't filled out a tax, re tax return myself. I just answer the questions and I know that's <coughs> everything's done. Similarly here, instead of having somebody who wants a divorce try and work through a form, it will ask them the questions, and from that it will produce the document, and then we have an e-filing process for that if they want to utilize it. And I think that is, we get 25 million hits a year on our self-help webpage for forms <laughs> and things like that. Uh, I've spoken to lawyers and they say, they're not all self-represented. They're probably our young lawyers who are trying to figure out how to draft something, uh, mm -hmm. which is probably true. But 25 million hits, I think that means a lot of people are looking to the court to provide the forms and some guidance on how to fill out something because the number of people, and I'm guessing it's the same here, who are self-represented is going up. Mm -hmm. And so it helps them, it doesn't give them legal advice, but it gives them the tools to be able to do it rationally so that I'm not sitting on the bench trying to work through just a pile of nonsense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Fiona Rutherford working on, um, working with the HM court surface, same as uh, Damon and Neil, okay. the last two questions. <laughs> um, just an extension on from that, from the last question. What have you done to um, assist those people who are more vulnerable, who don't read, who uh, don't understand English? Good question. Well, keep in mind that we are subject to the Americans with Disability Act. And while literacy and language is not considered a disability, uh, things like hard of hearing and all that, so all our web pages have to be compliant with ADA so that uh, those who are either blind or deaf can access our web pages. We also have a self-help center where all those forms, instead of just being on the web, they can actually come and work with people. We have multilingual clerks who help them with the forms just as if they were on the computer. Uh, we have interpreters, if necessary, who can come down and help people. Because of our size, we have three uh, languages that tend to be our most used for uh, interpreters. <coughs> Spanish, Somalian, and uh, probably Hmong is our largest. So we have interpreters who are readily available to do that to help people if they come in to our self-help centers. And they do a lot of business as well uh, at the counters because of people, mostly people, in fact, who have language difficulties, we have to help out by providing that service, and we do. Uh, and the literacy uh, is not as big an issue, but we do have 
at the self-help center people, and when they just come in and they say, I don't know what to do, what I want to do is my landlord's suing me. Uh, the clerk will say, well, this is, and they'll kind of explain what's going on. And we have volunteer lawyers on many days who they will actually be able to send them to. They won't represent them in court, but they will give them some advice and say, well, when your landlord is suing you, here's what he's saying, here's what you need to do in response. So that helps as well, having those self-help centers. Thank you. Um, Judge Cahill, what do you anticipate being the next major technology to have an impact in U.S. criminal courts? I mentioned one already, and that's document integration, where we aren't producing a document in Word, and then we go to an e-file system, and we attach it to, and put in all the... It'll be where we build it all in to automate all the data entry part, to pull it from the system. For example, if a probation officer puts in that this is case number 27 cr 15586, that automatically will kick in where it has to go and who it has to go to. So the more and more we roll out document integration where people are producing the document and then just hitting the send button and takes care of all the, the sending and the transporting, I think that's the way of the future. But it's in more of a larger context of workflow. And I say this to every vendor I meet with, it's you cannot just give me a standalone system where we pump in data and that somebody then can read the data. This has, you have to build in workflow. It has to go from the police, to the prosecution, to the courts, and so all those steps should be automated. Uh, the one difference we have is we have a uh, government produced charging system. It's not a vendor. It's something that our Bureau of Criminal Apprehension designed, and it's a workflow. Prosecutor has, gets the police reports electronically from the police. They draft up a complaint. They send it electronically through the system, not through email, back to the police. The police read it. If they are willing to sign it, they sign it with a notary. Then it gets automatically sent to the signing judge. The signing judge it comes up in my queue automatically. I can even show you that today because it is web-based and I was just looking at it this morning. You bring it up, sign it, and then it automatically goes to court administration, automatically gets filed. It's that type of integration of workflow. You can't just design a system that's just a standalone data consumer. You have to design, and what the future is going to be is a workflow where what we're all doing is the substantive work. The transporting and the administrative stuff, the routine, is all, should all be automated. My mantra being with our, our staff is automate the routine, humanize the complex. And I've told them, this is such an evolutionary process, you're not all losing your jobs. Hmm. You will just become problem solvers, and we will require the court staff be more sophisticated, perhaps because they will have to be problem solvers. They will have to be at our self-help center dealing with those who are, uh, have trouble reading or with language difficulties. They'll have to work through with some of those people before they can e-file. They'll have to be quite sophisticated in problem solving because the routine stuff is going to be automated and I think that's the future. Hmm. Okay, thank you. You've talked about vendor solutions and vendor management and you've talked about internally developed solutions as well. Mm -hmm. What's been your experience of kind of combining self-build solutions with vendor solutions? I think it's usually best when you have the large vendor solution first and then you figure out what you're going to build off of that. If you are really risky and want to jump off a bridge without a parachute, build everything yourself. I don't recommend it. Our prosecutors tried that. It was an unmitigated disaster. Uh, I think it's better that because of the complexity nowadays, these are not Microsoft Access databases. These are complex relational databases with a lot of stuff going on. As I said, a million messages being pushed a month in the state of Minnesota, that's a lot of complex intera interactions. That's a lot to keep up. And so I think it's best for the large complex case management that you work with a vendor who has experience in the area, whoever that is. But they better meet certain standards of interoperability. And then you can figure out what you need to build off of that. For example, we built our charging module. We did not want to have the vendor provide us that charging. Why? Because we wanted to have our own system where before it actually even got to the court, our Bureau of Criminal Apprehension was able to match up the name in that charge with the right person so that they could maintain an accurate criminal history. And the system that we have does, is not able to do that. So that's why they built the workflow uh, to be able to capture both person and criminal history and make sure they stay together. Uh, the other one is Benchworks, which is the basic case management system is actually used by a lot of judges, but they wanted something that was designed by judges. So we had judges 
literally sitting next to developers, shoulder to shoulder, going over a screen saying, I like that, now I need this. Can you put a document icon there for the complaint because that's what I look at most often. And just spent a lot of time developing that by having a judge sit next. And I think that's the other lesson, which is mm -hmm. you gotta have subject matter experts, the police prosecutors, the people who do the work every day working with your developers to come up with these things. But our judges did that, now we have this Benchworks, which uh, is something that we built ourselves using, uh, it's like a skin over our case management system. So, and if you don't have access to the application programming interfaces, did I get that right? The APIs from your vendor, you should complain because you need those interfaces to be able to build some of your own tools. Thank you, Judge Cahill. Um, I, I think we've got time for just one or two brief questions from the audience, if there are any at this stage. Yes, uh, there's, in fact, there's two over there. Thank you. Clive Morgan, uh, Blue, Blue Lightworks. With all what you've implemented in, uh, in your particular state in the US, is there any plans to reuse that in other states across the US and get the same benefits and economy of scale? Uh, we have a vendor for our case management system and, most, and it's actually in uh, about 25% of the jurisdictions around the state. And we get together with other states that use that system to talk about development ideas or things that we're using, changes in business process that might work in other states. And so we actually, in fact, the Court Technology Conference, uh, which is put on by our National Center for State Courts, is in September, is in Minneapolis. And so we're gonna be meeting with a lot of those people, and we do meet periodically to talk about what developments we'd like to see with our vendor. And I think that's true with most large vendors is they have user groups that get together and talk about development they can change because the more you can uh, have development ideas that are standardized, the better. Every jurisdiction is gonna need some customization, but the more you can come up with ideas that make sense, the better. So user groups are also an important factor. I've got um, David Redhouse from the prison service. I just wanted to return to that issue really of whether it works or not, but perhaps in the slightly wider sense about um, <clears throat> whether the, the system as a whole uh, is helped to work um, by this. Because I take your point about not electronifying the existing process, but I wonder whether what we're doing or what you've been doing is electronifying the existing system. Is there any suggestion that in terms of wider measures like victim satisfaction or dealing with reoffending rates or an ever-rising prison population that this, uh, that this is working any better? Yeah, what efficiencies are we getting? Because if we're just more efficient but the service and we're making our lawyers work harder, what good is it? You're right. Uh, I think a good example is not having a paper file. We have 580 staff who work in our district. Uh, in one unit of 20, just because of uh, making our file electronic, even before e-filing by lawyers, but just scanning and making the doc, uh, the manager there came and just told me that she was able to save one entire FTE because of the time that they usually were spent tracking down paper files, or taking the paper and getting it to the right file, or getting the files collected for court. And the amount of time that was saved by the electronic file I was being there, they were actually able to save that one uh, full-time employee and convert them to a, another use. And so if your agencies are like mine, most of your costs are personnel. And so if you don't figure out a way to reduce your force gradually by having some of these efficiencies, you're, they're going to get cut anyway, and then you won't have it. So I think the one efficiency is electronic means less chasing papers, number one. But we do have, and I've heard uh, comments from the public, they do the, like the electronic system that they can go right down to uh, our record center and just look on the computer everything they want to see. They don't have to interact with a clerk, wait for the clerk to find the file, look through it, make sure that they only have public documents. They like the fact that they go right up there and, and take care of it. We allow them to take a picture if they would like of the screen instead of paying a copy cost. Uh, so there's a variety of things uh, that we've heard from the public. The victims um, generally dealing with the prosecutors and so the electronic charging has sped up the charging process. To that extent, it's a good victim service because paper complaints are not being walked in from 20 miles away from the police officer who has to come down and sign it or bring the police reports. So I think the lack of transportation time means things are being done quicker and I think for victims that's a good thing. Uh, but ultimately it's access. It's the access, it's the quick access to all the information you have, be it by somebody in the court system who needs it or one of the lawyers involved in the case. Uh, 
and they complain a little bit about having to do things differently, but once they actually get on board and are able to access things, they've become quite adept at it. They've actually expressed a greater deal of satisfaction that they don't spend a lot of administrative time. They could actually work with clients on the important thing. The last in the system is the prison. Oz tends to be the tail that never wags the dog. Uh, it ends up with everything. And I think that's a good example of where we need to start sending the data uh, automatically to the prison. So before somebody even gets there, they know exactly what the story is. And I think that's where we're doing a little bit of that now, but certainly not enough. That, when that person shows up at the prison, they should know who it is, what they've done, what their history is, what their gang affiliation is, uh, what keep separates they have from other prisoners who they've testified against or what. Uh, all those things that should automatically be sent so that before they even hit the prison door, they're ready for them. We haven't done that and that's where we need to go. Hmm. Oh, there's one more down here. So Jim Leeson from Thomson Reuters. Uh, <laughs> I hope I'm allowed to ask a question. Um, so we heard a lot this morning about, uh, and in the Leveson report, around uh, uh, virtual hearings and uh, telephone conferences with courts, uh, with prisons and, and the like. Well, what's the experience been in, in Minnesota around that? Remote hearings uh, do exist in Minnesota. We have a culture that is contrary to having remote hearings. We want all the parties in the room. Uh, but for example, civil cases where lawyers are disputing disclosure, we have a lot of telephone conferences in that. But the idea that remote hearings by uh, teleconference is the answer to all the efficiencies, I don't think is necessarily true. It might with people who are in prison if you have a lot of transportation costs uh, and for timeliness. But we only do those for the minor cases. If somebody's in prison for a major offense, they can do some video conferencing to clean up some, maybe some traffic tickets or they have. But we don't have a culture of doing a lot of remote teleconferencing. And to be honest, you have to look at your cost drivers. If we are in budget cutting times, what's your cost driver? And generally, I don't know if it's transporting prisoners is a major cost driver. It's always going to be there. Uh, but how much is it? Most of, I think, we found out is it's the back office administrative data entry of the same data that the police took. So it's that messaging. Remember I said a million messages a month. That's a million data entry points we've been able to eliminate having human hands cover that. And I think that's your cost driver. It's all that administrative back office work tends to be a, a bigger driver. So that's what we focused on as opposed to expanding our remote hearings. We do some uh, in civil commitment cases where somebody's hospitalized with our state hospital system. We have that used quite a bit because we don't want to interrupt the person's treatment. Because some of those hospitals are 50, 100 miles away. We don't want to transport them, interrupt their treatment in or just to have a hearing. So that's an example where we use it, where it can be better service to the client themselves. But also, uh, it doesn't, it's not the panacea. It's not going to solve all your cost driving issues. And that's where you have to need to look. What am I going to focus on? What are my cost drivers? Thank you, Judge Cahill. We're, we're, we're coming up to the close of the allotted time. I'd just like to ask you one final brief question. Um, how do you think tomorrow's lawyers and judges will operate in this new environment that we're creating for them? Well, I think uh, one of the speakers said it this morning. The upcoming generation is used to this. In fact, we had a fairly new judge, uh, fairly young, one of the rural judges, just appointed to the bench. She was appointed to one of our counties that is entirely paperless. Uh, not all our counties are yet. They will be by next year. She worked for a while. Then she had to work in another county for a while, same district. And she was just not happy because they threw a paper file at her. And she said, I don't want to have to dig through this. I want to be able to click and see the document and move on to the next case. And so that's a good example, I think, of how the new, next generation is. They will look on the use of paper and transporting paper files, just like we look on scrolls, <laughs> uh, that it's antiquated, and typewriters, and cassette tapes, and all the other <laughs> technology that has gone away. Uh, I think they're used to it already. Uh, ask, well, probably there's not a lawyer in the, in the audience here who uses books anymore to do legal research. And I think that will become even more as we go on. Digital will be what uh, new lawyers grew up with, and I think they'll not only expect it, but demand it. Thank you, Judge. That was 
a fascinating discussion. Um, thank you to all of you who've participated. Um, Judge Cahill has kindly agreed to, uh, to stick around for the rem remainder of the, confidence, uh, the conference. Uh, and we'll be, we'll be in this room during the, the half hour break that's immediately to come. If you'd like to talk to Judge Cahill, uh, the Thomson Reuters team will be around as well. Um, but please do join me in giving your thanks to, to Judge Cahill. Thanks, thank you. Thank you.